cookware in the 18th century is so different than cookware that we have today. It's made out of different things and it's designed differently. We're gonna be talking about 18th century cookware, how it's different from cookware today. We got this wonderful guest here, Michael Dragoo, who's been on the channel many, many times and he loves collecting 18th century cookware. So he's brought much of his collection in here. Thank you, Michael, for bringing all this wonderful stuff in. What are we starting out with? So we're gonna to start today with trammels. Trammels would have held the uh, bulge pots and all the other cooking implements um, that were used. In all three of these cases, um, there would have been a lug pole, about yay big in diameter, green wood, and it would have been put up and behind and in front of the fireplace. There are smaller versions of all of these, and um, they would have been used on a crane. And you've seen those in, in fireplaces. They're hinged on one side or the other, a triangular manner, and you can position your your vessel over whatever fire source you've got. Interesting thing about these particular pieces that you got here is that they're huge. Yeah. These things are big. We gotta think about what's going on with cooking in the 18th century. They're hard. We're giant. We think of little fireplaces and houses today, and they're only, you know, maybe this high. A fireplace in the 18th century might have its hearth at my head height of uh, the, the uh, mantelpiece. So they're giant. And we, we might have very large outdoor cooking things too. Right. So we need big uh, trammels and S-hooks. So uh, one of the things we carry is just a simple small S-hook. That doesn't, it's not very useful when you've got a, a giant pot or a huge, you know, tall fireplace. So there's a lot of different things that we use to, you know, keep things right. up off the fire in the 18th century. Right. We don't need those much today, do we? Um, this is a hook and chain. It's the most universal. Um, you would bring it around the, the lug pole and then bring it through your, your uh, bale or hook it directly to the bale. It could hang more than one vessel at a time. The next one is a sawtooth. This would have been either in a, a summer kitchen mm -hmm. or in a barn or outside if you're doing if you're reducing uh, animal uh, fats or you're making apple butter or something where you've got a large pot and you need a lot of a lot of space. And then you're adjusting by just by moving this up or down. And as your fire's going, you're wanting to sometimes simmer or boil. So as things happen in the pot, you're just wanting to, without having to change the fire source, you're removing, you're bringing the, uh, the pot away from the fire source a little bit. Yeah, you need a lot of adjustability in the 18th century because you are working with a wood fire and it's going up and down in heat all the mm -hmm. time. So you have to have this very adjustable way to move your pots up and down. And I need help. My largest bulge pot is probably a five or six gallon and I can't lift it with one hand and adjust this with my other two hands. I need help, and they needed help uh, in the kitchen. And the third one is called a lug and hole. This is a very primitive one. It's, um, I, I would call it farm forged. Oh, yeah. um, someone needed one bad enough and they didn't care what it looked like. It's been roughly punched. Um, it's been roughly put together with several pieces. But the gist of it is very much like the sawtooth. This thing is going up and down. You're pulling this out and you're raising or lowering and you're popping it in a hole, yeah. whatever height. It's the easiest one for me to work with and when I'm on location, um, I bring these others to show, but I use this one. This is the easiest for me. Some of the things that we're gonna be looking at today are cast pieces, cast iron. These are forged, so blacksmith is gonna be making these and we can see wonderful welds that these were put together. They didn't have one long strip of metal. Yeah. It was exactly the right length, so they had to weld this thing together and then punch the holes. Right. It's a lot of work, even though it seems like a pretty crude piece. And they're, 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 they're not going to the local big box store and buying pieces of right. iron. They're re-manufacturing things. If something's broken and can't be repaired, it turns into something else. I, we're not, I didn't bring it today, we're not talking about that type of thing, but I've got a chopper uh, that used to be a wood file. Um, mm. The iron file got dull. They didn't have a way to sharpen it. And so they turned it into something else they needed worse. And, and you can imagine that, that this piece may have come from something on a wagon or something. This, mm -hmm. These pieces may have been from something else. The guy needed a trammel and he created one. This one's a great example. This particular um, 
uh, trammel in that even the metal they used is different than what we would do today. Any blacksmith today is just going to grab a nice piece of mild steel and work it. And it's really, it just works like butter compared to the steel there or the iron they were working with in the 18th century. This is wrought iron and you can almost see it. It's like a grain like wood. Wonderful uh, to see these old pieces made out of the metal they used in the 18th century. If you're interested in wrought iron and how it works and how it's different, I had a great interview with Jamie Tyree and it's a great one to reference for what how wrought iron really works and how it's different. Trivets. Yeah. Trivets. Many sizes, many shapes, virtually the same usage. You're trying to keep your vessel off the fire. In this case, we're not hanging from above. Uh, we're supporting from below. We're going to bring our coals or a fire source, our heat source into uh, up front and we're gonna put a, use a variety of things to keep a variety of differently shaped vessels off the fire. There are also trivets that aren't necessarily for keeping things up off the fire, but just off of up off of hot surfaces. So if we're using a Dutch oven and we want to bake a pie in it, then we need something to take our pie plan and bring it up off the bottom of that or else it'll burn our right. pie in the bottom. So we always use a nice small trivet like this one that goes underneath our pie pan, just holds it up off the surface and gives us like convection heat all the way around right. it without burning the bottom. So we've got, you know, low trivets, we got high trivets. You might have several different ones uh, for kind of heat sources. When I'm using my brazier, yep. sometimes I want it higher than the brazier. You, you can use these a variety of different ways. And these are triangular because in a round pot, it's always you can always find a center. We've got gridirons here and, and similar pieces. Uh, how do we cook? We're either on the fire, we can use them as a trivet, or we can cook meat right on the fire. You've got a lot of different designs here. Yep. We've got a rotating one, so obviously this was probably used a lot more for cooking meat right on the fire, so you could rotate it around. Get an even cook. Plus, if you've, your radiant heat is here, you're right. and you've got a vessel here, you're turning it so it's evenly exactly. cooking. Once again, it's very flexible. These two are good examples of a variation. So this one is something you'd find in the household. It's got rigid handles and everything where you've got lots of space and you want one that, that works. Um, and you, you can store it, but if you're traveling, uh, this is a this is a replica of the George Washington grill. So we have in the museums his whole cooking outfit, and you can see it folds up. It does exactly what that one does, except we can put it into a small space. When I look at period pieces or older pieces, uh, I, I love when we find the wear and tear on one and we can see the age in it. This one's fun because it, you know, it's done a lot of rusting over the years. You know, it's not new. Uh, we have a lot of pitting on it. So we know it's an older piece and how it would be constructed. They wouldn't, they don't construct things the same way uh, today as they constructed them in the 18th century. This isn't a bolt. This is a rivet that was welded into place. We can see the individual welds and how they got these, these bars yeah. to stay in place. Yeah. Today, you would use, um, you would use a welder that is like a, you know, an electric welder or a gas welder. In the 18th century, they had this on the forge. They had to heat these two things up to white hot metal and, you know, hammer them together. And one. that's hard to do. Yeah. Griddles could come once again in any shape and any size. We've got a couple of them. This is a really old griddle. Um, and this is a little newer. This one is going to sit on a trivet or a something, rocks, bricks, something holding it off the fire. Right. Um, and this one has its own legs, but you can also hang it. This one reminds me of uh, how they would cook, you know, griddle cakes, oat cakes in, say, Scotland. Uh, this piece is, I'm, I am really, it's hard to say. It's its old enough that it's, you know, so rusty that it's, it's hard to understand exactly how it was made, but I believe it is probably cast iron. Cast like they, like they cooked, or like they cast fire backs in the 18th century. Uh, although the handle looks like it might be welded on, but I think this is just so that it had extra strength here, yeah. this, these little bosses. But this is an incredible piece. Yeah. I love this one. It's nothing wow. runny. I'll tell you, it has to right. be something with more body right. to it. Right, But, you right. know, pancakes yep. and all those things, you can cook right yeah. on these. Uh, this one, wow. We're starting to get a little ridge to it. Yeah. It's an earlier one. It's these. They were coming up with these things 
um, up through Victorian times. I probably mm -hmm. in the 1910s I could have purchased one. But this is just the way it's constructed. It's a little older. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Just the way they forge these together and the simple castings. They aren't complex castings, so mm -hmm. that's kind of how you date these things. It's a drawn piece of iron instead of a piece of wire. In this time period, they don't have steel wire they're drawing. They're taking a piece of iron and they're heating it and they're drawing it out. Yep. Wafer irons, waffle iron. Everything from under, under the sun, any shape, any floral or design pattern. These could be communion wafers. They could be just any kind of wafer, but a wafer is paper thin. I've done these on demonstrations a couple years now. Um, and I get three out of every five or six. Yeah. They, they are easy to burn. You're buttering it each time. You're putting a little bit of stuff in. Um, you're pressing it together. You're heating both sides hotter than heck. And then you're, um, just for a short period of time, when it starts to look brown on the outside, you pop it out and you've got a nice wafer. This is a waffle iron and it's a totally different item, right? So instead yeah. of a really thin, crisp little cookie thing, this is going to make a waffle like we think of waffles today. Yeah. This one's a beautiful handmade waffle yeah. iron. A lot of these would have cast pieces. This is a cast yep. on forged handles. So these are little cast pieces on forged handles. This is actually forged all the way. Yep. Uh, so it's kind of a rare piece in that. Usually you would actually see this as a cast piece, even right. the waffle irons. But this one, somebody went to t went to the effort to make a forged one, which is pretty neat. I think they were just showing off their skill. It's, it, I would still call it farm forged. Oh yeah. It's not a professional person doing it, but someone had enough talent to take a piece of iron and shape it accordingly. And then they're rolling this up into a, as close a circle as they can. Right. They're taking this piece and gouging and then cutting it or forming it to fit. Here's a handle attached. This one has one or two attachments for its handle. Mm -hmm. It's in umpteen parts and it's got a, once again, a rivet. Right. This is all, it's not like something I can unscrew to take apart. It's right. all, right. it's staying together. And these are and, all used very similarly. You just yeah. basically set these in the coals yeah. and wait for them to bring it up to heat. Now these, you don't get too hot. You don't get them red hot, but this, this is our salamander. This you would get red hot. You bring this, this is an actual cooking method to uh, heat something that you wanted to sort of broil the top of. So today in a fancy restaurant, they might do it with a blowtorch. Yeah. They come in and heat up the top of the, uh, the item you're cooking, a lot of times desserts or whatnot, and caramelize the sugar on top. In the 18th century, you would use a salamander. You'd get this red hot in the fire and then bring it over and cook the very top just before you put it on the on right. the table. And this one also reminds me of the, the connection with hoe cakes. So we did a couple of uh, hoe cake episodes and sometimes there's the thought that, oh, hoe cakes were cooked on hoes. And it turns out that there is an item, a cooking item in the 18th century that was called a cooking hoe that resembled a hoe, but actually it was almost exactly like a salamander except it tended to be have the handle nope. bent a little bit and they resembled a hoe but they were intended for cooking and you could cook on top of a salamander too you wouldn't get it as hot but you could make very very small sort of pancake items use them like a tiny griddle when some of these recipes will refer to your um your fireplace shovel as well mm -hmm. these were yeah. much and and that was something that was moving coals around and the like right. and you'd clean it off heat it up and put your hoe cake or whatever right on it so, right yeah and then we've got these um guys they're toddy irons or they have umpteen names many sizes sometimes it's a large ball depending on if it's a a, a bowl of of an of a, an adult beverage or if it's just a a small personalized vessel but you heat this up You've got your mixture of sugars and mm -hmm. and um, and spirits, and it's plunged in, and immediately the sugars surrounding it are caramelized, and it's a taste like you can't get unless right, you do right, that. Right. Um, yeah, if you've heard of loggerheads, like people are at loggerheads, yes. a loggerhead is a larger version, is the same thing, and people at loggerheads are fighting. Well, it'd be people with two different uh, ones. Imagine this, but you know, three or four times right. bigger. They're trying to hit each other. Yeah, if you're loggerheads with somebody, you're All right. you're fighting with a larger. Or you're, version you're very dense. You yeah. have a dense skull. <laughs> yes. There are times when we just want to roast meat over the fire. We have a couple of different items that we use for that, but they're generally called spits. So we're gonna use a spit. This is a hanging spit, it's a very small one. Um, 
we have a, a square rod here, not a round one. And the reason for that is if we had a round rod and we were trying to rotate it, the meat will slip on that and rotate around and we can't, we can't heat it properly. We can't cook it. Uh, so we use a square one and then many times we'll use these um, little spit forks that come in from the side. They're made so that they can't rotate on that and the meat stays where it needs to be. And in this case, we have a special hanger for it or we might have hangers that come down from the top uh, to do the, the uh, spit to hold it up, or we could even have a whole uh, piece that comes up from the bottom, sort of like a trussle that holds up our spit. Yep. They had mechanics, clock oh, mechanics, yeah, so. turning these things huge pieces. Yeah. I think your oven, your, your reflective oven could yep. very well have that right, in it. Right. And then we have a simple hanging spit. Yep. You might be smoking something. This thing may weigh mm -hmm. up in mm -hmm. the chimney. It could be down Roasting it meat can be more difficult because the top side of the meat doesn't get cooked as well. And so you have to take it off of the spit and then hook it back on another yeah. direction. But they are uh, a simple and versatile thing. We have to hold the, uh, the vessels up in some manner. Once again, they weren't producing wire per se. If they needed a piece of wire, they're going to have to take a hunk of, of iron, heat it, and just continually draw it out until it's thin enough to use. It's much easier to just have one of these pot lifters. I've got four or five of them in my collection. They can be really long, they can be really short, but you're taking this thing and you're hooking it in the ears, which is what the ears are for. You can hang it on your um, crane or any S hooks, anything you care to hang it on. And I use these exclusively when I'm at events. I either have a tripod or I rig up a, a lug pole and I, I only use these to hang them. I brought another item with me. It's made of iron. It's, it's kind of crude and yet it's kind of elegant in its simplicity. Someone needed a, a, a lifter of some type. I'm guessing it was for our wood stove, which is out of my time period, but I, I, it needed love and I brought it home and, and added it to the collection. But what it's showing is that whether they started with many pieces of iron and then brought them together at each end or started with a large piece of iron, split them, did this, decoration and then brought them back together. Somebody just took the time to, and it's a heat sink, kind of. <laughs> it's not really, it's, it's still hot, but it's just pretty. And, and someone went to the trouble, took the time to go to the trouble and, and not just create a quick tool that was handy, but to give it a, some of their own personal touch. So mm -hmm. you see that over and over again. It might be some simple end to a handle or some just decorative bit. On a, on a leg, something that nobody you see, but somebody wanted to just put themselves in that piece. Yep. And I'll tell you, 100, 200, 300 years later, when I'm using these things, it's that's so cool to just be a steward and to pass these on when I'm done with them. Mortar and pestle, these things have been used since 800, 700 yeah. AD. Um, and, and I know before that, that's when I start seeing it in writing. Um, it can be uh, out of a variety of things. Uh, we've got large ones out of wood. Depends on what you're reducing. You know, you can reduce uh, meats to get them fibrous um, using a wooden mortar and pestle. But if you're talking about grains, seeds, um, some spices, you're gonna need to get into something. This is gonna be a very fine grind. And uh, this is gonna be a little coarser. These are the food processors of the 18th century. We wanna, you know, turn something into a mush. <laughs> we want to break it down into the smallest possible sort of components. We might even want to turn something into a paste. Mm. We're going to do a mortar and pestle. They haven't figured out the cylinder and the screw yet right. to be able to reduce it to be hamburger. Right. If I wanted a hamburger, I'd have to mince it and then uh, put it in here and, and reduce it further till it's fibrous. And we found on that um, meatball, a video we did ages ago, mm -hmm. um, that was two or three different meats. One of them right. was a smoked ham, a cured ham of some type. And that does not want to behave. It, it right. needs to, you, it just wants to be little bitty pieces. Right. So you've got to turn it into fibers to have it connect with other, mm -hmm. other things. And you'll see in early painting, 17th century and 18th century, uh, mortar and pestles that are giant. So you'll see marble ones that are this big around yeah. that you could really work on large pieces at once. They're amazing pieces and you just don't see them used in cooking too much today. I mean, we'll see small ones like this for kind of grinding up uh, spices and herbs, but you don't use them that much today. And we've seen 
on the different uh, places we've gone or native settlements, mm -hmm. you'll see a, um, a larger um, Log, stump. Yeah. Yes, that's been uh, burnt, you know, controlled charcoal burnt down and it's hollow and now they've got a, right. uh, something else that they're just reducing the corn with. Now we got to the amazing collection here of all these cooking vessels per se. Tell me about what we got. Well, uh, to your right, um, we have um, skillets mm -hmm. and a variety of forms. And that's that's just a couple of the ones, yeah, and right. the, um, from different time periods. Uh, these are posnets in brass, but mostly iron. And then these are bulge pots or cauldrons or call them what you will. And I've, like I said, before I've got, I think it's like a six gallon one, which I can hardly right. lift all the way down to these little guys. We've got some really interesting things going on with a lot of these. Now, the fun thing I like about the posnets is because they're used on a fireplace. And if we, if we look at a lot of them, especially the earlier they are, look at this one, it, it really shows off what's going on. Yeah. You, you, you put this on your brick hearth, right? And you're cooking in it and you're done. You drag it back to where you're working because it's hot and you don't want to lift it up. And the feet on the front always get sort of ground off. And so they all sort of, and all, the older they get, the more they tip it. forward. Yes. So we can see them get used over yeah. and over. Early, early, they're made out of brass. Same thing is true for these guys. Uh, the pots from the 16th century and the 17th century were made out of bell metal or brass, um, actually a bit more like bronze and they're not actually as healthy. You can poison people with those. Mm. So to, to make them less expensive, easier to produce, and safer for it to use, they moved into cast iron yeah. as time went on. So this brass one is probably a little earlier yeah. than these iron ones, which get popular in the late 18th century and very, very popular in the 19th century. Inside of that. Um, that's um, called a gate. Right. Um, where the metal is uh, entering the, uh, the, the form. Mm -hmm. And once again, the fewer, that's kind of how you date it. Um, in the time period, they're not very sophisticated with their tempering. And we're talking about iron here, not steel per se. And so there's nothing as hard as this as this. It's like trying to grind or file a diamond with a diamond or file a piece of wood with a piece of wood. Right. Um, so they're not finished. Right. The, the, the casting is broken off. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. just, and these, these feet aren't one piece. They've right. been welded on well, roughly. The, the feet are actually cast separately and then set into yep. the mold and then cast around them. Yep, yep. And so you see these time and time again, of these, these rough, unfinished uh, edges. And as someone who sells a current version of these kinds of pots, uh, they are amazing work because of the thinness of the metal. So most foundries today don't want to cast anything nearly as thin as these pieces were done in the 18th and 19th century. Um, the problem with them as they cast a very thin is there's a bunch of pieces that just don't work out. It's like, well, that one we'll throw out. So maybe half of the ones they cast were no good. But since it, labor was inexpensive, they didn't have a problem with that. Mm. Uh, when labor gets expensive, then, well, every single one has to turn out. So we'll increase the, the, the thickness of the wall so that we get 95% yeah. of them to turn out every time. Yeah. So you can tell an old one every time, they're super thin. And this one, he was just talking about the wear of the legs. Now, yeah. got a couple this that are, one. <laughs> this one is so thin. Not unlike its owner, pot belly. <laughs> Um, the legs have been drawn so many times, it's starting to rub on the bottom. Yeah. It doesn't sit on its legs anymore. Actually, uh, one we just used in a video earlier, this guy right here. Can you move that guy yeah. for a second? Um, the, the, the metal may have been softer, mm -hmm. or they just, for some reason, but look, you can <laughs> see how that's sitting at an angle. Um, and that's, that's what he's talking about. These things are used so often, over and over again, pulling, 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 mm -hmm. hundreds of years in some cases. So these can look like they're ex almost exactly the same thing, but uh, these are related to frying pans, they're skillets, and the posnets are really the ancestor to saucepans. They have a much higher uh, top to them, and uh, unlike today's saucepans, they generally had a rounded bottom. Exactly why they had a rounded bottom instead of a square bottom, maybe it's because you know, we don't want to, it's harder to make a round pot and pan today. We don't need that because we're putting them on burners, but these were always made to use over the fire. So they tended to have this rounded bottom. So Michael, all these pieces you brought in have 
are beautiful in that they're wonderfully seasoned. Yes. So when we're using cast iron in the 18th century and people still use cast iron today, uh, this is as close as you can get to a, a Teflon pan, a Silverstone pan. They're non-stick surfaces that uh, if they aren't seasoned, you could not cook in them. Right. They're terrible. So right. um, tell us about your seasoning. How do you, what do you well, do? I, I, think, I think I do the same way you do. I, I'll, I'll set my oven, um, the, the home oven, to 550. They're about as hot as your oven will go. And um, I'll put the piece in and let it get too hot to the touch, but not that high a temperature. I'm trying to get the molecules of the iron to just expand a little bit. And then I pull it out and um, I put it on top of the stove where it's not gonna burn my countertop. And I'll take some, um, some uh, Crisco, um, if I can mention name brands, it's just, a, it's a purified fat. And I, I use a, a paper towel and I'll just coat the entire surface. And then I'll take more paper towel and I'll remove as much as that as I can. I don't want anything puddling, otherwise I'm gonna have troubles down the road. So I'm just completely covering it, completely removing it. I turn it upside down and put it in the oven and I don't touch it again, I leave it at 550 till it stops smoking. You're trying to carbonize that oil. You want this finish. You don't want something sticky, you should never, ooh. Gonna get letters probably. There are lots of ways of seasoning, and and the, the way that doesn't um, foul the iron and doesn't go rancid is to carbonize some right. kind of fat. And I try to go for the pure fat because I don't want impurities in my right. Uh, flaxseed oil is one of the <laughs> lowest temperature yeah. ones that happens, so flaxseed oil can work well. Uh, a lot of different oils work well, and there are probably. 10 or 20 different ways to season and there's you know, a lot of controversy. You no, know, this is the best way to season and that's the best way. I say whatever works for you is what works for you on seasoning, but it seals the iron and it makes it non-stick. Right. There's, it, it keeps it from rusting. There's just so many reasons let's why. At, let's look at the inside of that. Yeah. I'll, there's some rough there. Yeah, this one's super rough on the I, inside. I've, I've seasoned that about three times. I'm ready for the next season. It's super rough. It was full of rust and it's, it's not going to stick. Um, so, but what's the what's the killer on on seasoning? What's going to ruin your seasoning the fastest? Mr. Spatula <laughs> is, is going to is the arch nemesis of seasoning, right. and that's all they had to work with. You know, they weren't having plastic. Um, you would use wood, right. um, uh, and I use wood. Uh, very rarely will I use this, but right. um, uh, At that'll least on this kind of a surface. That'll ruin a. Yeah, you've got to go back and reseason because yeah. if you don't, you're going to have sticking food. Right, just like today. Uh, yeah, you don't use animal fat and then put it in your drawer because it'll go rancid. And then the iron, you have that rancid taste from the iron. It's just like if you went nuts and started scrubbing and using a, a soap scrubby. I use, um, I use um, my scrubbies I make out of um, broom straw mm -hmm. um, and, and I use water right. and I'll let things soak. But once I'm done scrubbing and it's all off, right. I'll dry it and then I turn it upside down on my burner mm -hmm. on my stove mm -hmm. and just, just try to get all that heat. water off. Yeah, right. just to get that water off. And right. This you is... do that, they last once again forever. They've lasted 300 years over. So right. And and this does. It goes right down into the pores yeah. of the iron to seal it so yeah. that it won't rust and is easy to clean. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael, for bringing all these amazing pieces in. These, uh, many of these pieces are 150 years old, 250 years old, and it's it's incredible to see how you know they're still useful. We still can enjoy them. We cook in them. Many times we're doing a cooking episode, and you bring in an uh, old piece, and we're cooking in that. So uh, I always find it uh, really fun to use these old pieces and you know compare and contrast them with you know, modern pieces that we would use today, how much different these are, and, you know, we can still enjoy them. So I really like oh, this. It's my Thank pleasure. You. Thank okay. you so much. You're welcome. I, um, it's a kick to just be the caretaker for a yeah, while, right. to bring them back and lovingly use them and then pass them on. It's, right. It's such a thrill. They'll so. still be useful in yep. another 150 easily, years. Easily. Just, Thank you. Just incredible. So if you're interested in more where we kind of pick apart something that's old and old piece and try to understand it, make sure to check out this episode where Brandon and I look at an old set of bellows so that we can understand them so we can rebuild them. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.